Think Forward. Think Research Channel. From the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2005 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Evolution, Constant Change and Common Threads, will be given by Dr. Sean B. Carroll, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Dr. David M. Kingsley, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator at Stanford University School of Medicine. The third lecture is titled, Fossils, Genes, and Embryos. And now, to introduce our program, the President of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Good morning, and welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and to the 2005 Holiday Lectures on Science evolution, constant change, and common threads. In his last lecture, David Kingsley talked about domestication of wolves into dogs and of teosinte into corn. Today, he's going to delve deeper into evolutionary time and show us about how genetic changes in living populations today relate to changes that we see in the fossil record. Now, David primarily studies fish, but the rules and mechanisms that he has uncovered have broad implications for the evolution of all kinds of species, including humans. One of the surprising things that David has discovered is that evolution appears to be a great recycler, using the same mechanisms over and over again. The talk is entitled, Fossils, Genes, and Embryos, and now, Here's a video of David at work. For me, why I went into science and one of the most rewarding things about it is the rare opportunity to get to spend your life on solving problems or studying questions that people have wondered about for um, thousands of years. Uh, I think we live right now at a time when the techniques are available to pick any problem that you're interested in and so is this one get to be the, from the, the one who solves uh, some age-old problem. How does that and time? that's, I think, a fairly unusual opportunity. But for a long time, the problems weren't solved because the methods weren't available to work on them. What's different now is that the methods are available to work on them. So I think 100 years from now, people will look back and say, that must have been an incredible time to be doing science. The methods were there, and all you had to do was pick the problem you were interested in and go apply the methods. And uh, what could be more exciting than to live in that sliver of time when wonderful unsolved problems are solvable uh, by the application of methods that have worked repeatedly in other areas. There's no other job in the world where you can have the privilege of getting to spend your time trying to figure out how things work. I think it's important for students not to decide whether they like science based just on the way science has been presented to them in, in a few classes. So if you can find some way uh, to get into a lab or to interact with scientists doing science, that it's the best possible way to see the difference between the problem solving that scientists really do and the way it's normally uh, presented in the classroom. And there's a big difference between memorizing the words that scientists use and actually doing science. And I think that people have to get past that nomenclature uh, aspect and get into a lab environment where they can actually do science. And that means 
to be confronted with a problem where the answer isn't known. So don't memorize the answer, try to find the answer. Welcome back everybody. Yesterday uh, we saw how selection by humans uh, has transformed plants and animals into uh, the modern forms that we see around us today. Darwin and Wallace uh, both realized that the same principles of selection that have so dramatically uh, changed both plants and animals uh, under domestication should also act in nature. So while plants and animals uh, vary in all directions, the differences are inherited. Many more individuals are produced than can possibly survive and reproduce, so that creates a competitive situation. Favorable variants will inevitably leave more offspring, and these laws of nature create a process of natural selection that will extensively modify organisms over time. So based on these laws, Darwin proposed that modern plants and animals are really just the youngest sprouts and twigs of an immense and ancient uh, tree of life, and that all organisms that have ever lived may be related by descent with modification, extending back to the very earliest stages of uh, life on Earth. Now, that I think is obviously a profound intellectual uh, leap. It's always struck me as large as the leap uh, that was made by Newton. Many of you know Newton, uh, he saw an apple falling in his backyard and realized that the same forces of gravity that control objects falling uh, in his backyard might also control the falling of the moon around the Earth, the orbiting of the Earth around the sun, and in fact the principles that construct the entire solar system. So Newton's scope for physics was uh, incredible, from, from apples to orbits, from his backyard to the entire solar system. And I think Darwin's uh, book had a similar breathtaking scope, from uh, pigeons in his backyard, in the very first chapter of The Origin of Species, to this immense tree of life that connects all living forms by modification, by descent, uh, by the final chapter of The Origin. Okay, so when, in 1859, uh, when Darwin's great theory was proposed, it already explained all sorts of confusing data from different uh, areas, including uh, odd facts from biogeography, the, uh, the existence of closely related organisms and island groups uh, like the Galapagos, facts from paleontology, like the fact that uh, modern mammals are only found in the most recent fossil strata, facts from embryology, Common structures are seen in the embryos of animals that look very different from each other. And unusual facts from morphology. So comparative anatomists had known for a long time that some structures existed in animals that were very hard to explain under the prevailing idea that each species had been intelligently designed to optimally match uh, its, its own environment. For example, lots of animals that live in caves never see light they have no reason to have eyes, and yet lots of cave animals have vestigial eyes. So eyes begin to form, or they form and they degenerate, or they form but they're completely covered by skin. So these are non-functional organs in an environment where eyes aren't needed. Very hard to imagine why they're there if each organism was designed to live in a cave, but easy to explain if current blind animals evolved from precursors that used to see. So descent with modification explains these structures as a vestige, a leftover from their common ancestry. Well, although uh, Darwin's theory explained lots of peculiar facts that existed in 1859, it also uh, set off a whole series of raging debates about all sorts of uh, other issues. Many scientists believe the Earth was too young uh, to be compatible with Darwin's theory of evolution when it was published in 1859. There was an absence of transitional forms that Darwin predicted should be all over the place uh, in the fossil record. Many people thought natural selection couldn't work the way Darwin proposed because any rare variants that occurred uh, would get swamped out by a form of blending inheritance that we'll come back to in a second. And finally, many people just fundamentally thought that animals looked too different from each other to have possibly come uh, from common ancestors. So all of these issues were extensively uh, debated uh, during Darwin's lifetime. He tried to address them in subsequent issues of the origin of species, but in fact, many of them weren't resolved uh, for decades. So let's come back and uh, talk about, about uh, each of these uh, key, key problems. Okay, 
How about the age of the Earth? The age of the Earth has been calculated uh, in lots of different ways. There was a famous calculation by Archbishop Usher in the 1600s that creation had occurred on October 23rd, 4004 BC. That estimate was based on uh, genealogy in the Bible. So in the 1800s, there was already accumulating geological evidence that the Earth must be uh, much older than that. One of Darwin's contemporaries was a famous physicist uh, named Lord Kelvin. How many of you guys have ever heard of uh, Kelvin? Yeah, right. This is the Kelvin of the second law of thermodynamics. This is also the Kelvin of the absolute temperature scale. So the degrees are named after uh, Lord Kelvin, one of the most famous physicists of, of the 1800s. So Kelvin had calculated uh, that the Earth couldn't be older than uh, the Earth and Sun uh, had a maximum age of 40 million years. That was the, based on the physics of the cooling of the Earth and Sun. That estimate bar bothered Darwin a lot because Darwin had estimated in the origin that it might take hundreds of millions of years uh, for his process of descent with modification to generate uh, this immense tree of life. So Darwin wanted 400 million years tenfold more uh, than Lord Kelvin thought was physically possible. So this debate uh, was actually uh, resolved by an amazing series of discoveries in 20th century physics that Darwin didn't live to see. Einstein realized uh, in the earliest 20th century that energy and mass are actually interconvertible. His famous equation E equals mc squared, E for energy and m for mass. Detailed measurements of the actual mass of atoms shows that four hydrogen atoms actually weigh slightly more than one helium atom. And the way the sun actually shines is a process of uh, fusion energy. So four hydrogen atoms are fused together to make one helium, and a small bit of excess mass is converted into energy. So the sun is a nuclear furnace, not the kind of conventional furnace that Kelvin had modeled uh, in the 1800s. You can actually measure the amount of hydrogen and helium in the sun and calculate how old the sun must be based on uh, that nuclear furnace. Similarly, around the turn of the century, radioactivity was discovered for the first time. So that uh, actually provided a new source of heat within rocks, and it also provided a brand new way to calculate the absolute age of rocks. Detailed uh, measurements uh, from both the physics of stars and the half-life of radioactive decay show that the Earth and the solar system are billions of years old, not millions of years old, so 100 times longer than uh, Lord Kelvin had estimated uh, during the debates with Darwin. So when Darwin said uh, that an infinite number of generations which the mind can't grasp must have succeeded each other in the long roll of years, he was even more right than he thought at the time. Okay, how about uh, the fossil record? Well, the fossil record has always been uh, imperfect. Darwin worried about this in the origin. Beginning as soon as the origin was published, lots of interesting fossils started to be published, and that's been true ever since. Uh, in 1861, two years after uh, the origin appeared, a spectacular fossil uh, was found. This was the first of several Archaeopteryx fossils. Remarkable preservation of uh, feather structures in uh, an ancient reptile. So uh, Archaeopteryx has traits of both birds and reptile. You can see feathers, but it's on uh, an ancient reptile that still has teeth, structures that are normally never found in modern birds. This kind of fossil with a mixture of traits of different organisms is exactly the kind of fossil uh, that Darwin's theory of descent with modification uh, predicted must exist. Well, key fossil discoveries have kept being made ever since uh, the origin. One of the biggest gaps in the fossil record that Darwin worried a lot about was the complete absence of any known fossils in uh, Precambrian strata. So the fossil record as Darwin knew it the first uh, appearance of fossil life in, in, the, uh, in the record at that time, by the time the fossils appeared, they were already complex and diverse. No record of uh, simple forms that Darwin uh, proposed must exist at the base of uh, his immense tree of life. Since the origin, the fossil evidence of life on Earth uh, has been pushed back in spectacular ways. Fossils of simple single-celled organisms have now been confirmed in rocks uh, that are billion years, billions of years old, uh, shown there in the figure at the top. Just as Darwin predicted, the early forms of life are much simpler than the uh, complex life that's seen later. When uh, the early fossil record looks like mats of bacteria, cyanobacteria, and single-celled microorganisms. 
Similarly, since 1859, the earliest forms of multicellular life have also been found in the fossil record. These also occur in rocks that predate the explosion of more complex forms uh, in the Cambrian. So unicellular life in billions of years old rocks, the earliest forms of multicellular life in Precambrian rocks, and in addition, many transitional fossils have been now, uh, now been found for higher animal groups. So let's go much later in the fossil record and talk about uh, the reinvasion of water uh, by mammals. We're used to thinking of vertebrates as, as land animals with skeletal structures that are appropriate for uh, walking around on two or four legs on land. Most mammals, that's true, but in fact, some mammals are found uh, in the ocean as aquatic organisms. They have streamlined bodies, such as seen here uh, in a manatee. So manatees have a streamlined body. They still have two forefins or, or flippers, but they no longer have hind limbs. Right? So um, they also have a series of other aquatic adaptations, nostrils that are located high up on the head for breathing uh, at, the, at the water air interface. Very unusual downturned uh, jaws that are only seen in manatees and a closely related uh, animal called dugongs. Unusual ribs. So most animals have ribs that are hollow, filled with uh, bone marrow. In manatees and dugongs, the ribs are actually solid. They're filled with bone. That's thought to serve as a form of ballast uh, for these marine creatures. And finally, in addition to those uh, features, manatees show some characteristics that suggest they may have evolved uh, from uh, land animals. That includes both toenails on their flippers and uh, vestigial hind limbs. So this shows a blow up of a manatee flipper. You can see out at the ends uh, these toenails. So it's very unusual because toenails are usually only found on uh, land animals. This was uh, recognized a long time ago. The manatee's toenails actually look very much like elephant toenails. DNA studies show that uh, the DNA of manatees and the DNA of elephants is more closely related than uh, most other mammals. So it looks like uh, these may have evolved from uh, four-legged creatures. In addition, although manatees don't have hind limbs, if you look at their skeleton, they do have tiny rudimentary pelvic bones where a hind limb uh, would normally be found. Okay, these aren't attached to the vertebral column. They can't support weight. There's no leg that comes off of the pelvis. Surprisingly, those uh, rudimentary uh, pelvic bones do still have a tiny hip socket, even though the femur isn't there. We actually have a manatee bone. I'll put it up here uh, at the front and invite you to come up during the break. This is the small rudimentary pelvis of a manatee. You can see a little circle here. This is uh, a vestigial hip socket for a ghost femur that's no longer, that's no longer there. Again, that's a, just like the vestigial eyes in cave organisms, the example of a kind of structure that's very hard to explain if manatees had been designed uh, from scratch to, uh, to live in the ocean. On the other hand, those kinds of structures are easy to explain if manatees actually evolved from four-legged uh, four precursors. Well, if manatees evolved from four-legged land animals, where are the supposed fossils of uh, intermediate forms? Well, the fossils are actually in Jamaica, a uh, very interesting paper that was published uh, in 2001 by Dr. Domning from the Howard University here in the Washington, D.C. area. He described a spectacular fossil that was found in 50 million year old deposits uh, in Jamaica. This uh, nearly complete skeleton shows all sorts of uh, characteristic diagnostic manatee features, including the nostrils uh, up on the top of the head characteristic solid ballast-like ribs, the unusual uh, downturned jaws that are only found in manatees and dugongs. Despite having all these features, it has another uh, very interesting feature. It still has hind limbs. So the hind limbs are present, and they look just as robust as the forelimbs. So exactly the kind of organism for evolving manatees from a previous uh, four-legged uh, ancestor. Other intermediate stages in pelvic reduction uh, have been found for this group. Manatees and dugongs belong to a group called the Sirenia, and other proto-Sirenia fossils have been shown that show intermediate stages of hind limb reduction. Here's a fossil where you can see the hind limbs are present, but they're now much smaller than the forelimbs. You still have a pelvis, a femur, and the lower leg bones. So we have now a fossil record that goes all the way from a complete four-legged looking manatee to things that have intermediate pelvic reduction and then the simple vestigial pelvis that's still found uh, in the modern forms. 
The other uh, group of marine mammals that's known are the cetaceans, uh, the whales and the dolphins. We actually have a dolphin skeleton here at the front of the auditorium. So dolphins also have a characteristic uh, streamlined marine body form. They have four flippers, but they don't have hind limbs. You can see here in the skeleton the obvious uh, flipper or forelimbs of the dolphin uh, up here at the front of the body. There are no hind limbs in the skeleton, but hanging beneath the vertebral column at the spot where a hind limb would normally be, you can again see these two rudimentary bones, unattached, no legs coming out, but these represent what's left of a pelvis uh, in this form of marine mammal. That kind of rudimentary pelvis suggests that dolphins and whales also evolved from four-legged land animals. If that's true, where are the transitional fossils uh, that show those precursors? Well, for uh, manatee and whale evolution, the uh, spectacular fossils have also been found in the last 20 years. In this case, the key fossils are located in Pakistan and Egypt. 47 million year old skeletons have uh, heads that look like whales but still have four legs with the hind limbs as robust as the forelimbs. The Egyptian fossils from 36 million years again show skulls that are clearly whale-like. You can now see that the hind limb has been extensively reduced, very small, still has a pelvis and a femur and the lower leg bones, but it's detached from the vertebral column, could no longer support uh, body weight. Again, a beautiful set of transitional fossils from a four-legged uh, animal with the skull of a whale to partial hind limb reduction to the kind of tiny rudimentary pelvises that you see today uh, in a modern uh, dolphin or whale. Finally, large and complete mammalian fossils are rare, but an amazingly uh, detailed fossil record exists for the process of pelvic reduction in sticklebacks. Uh, we introduced sticklebacks yesterday. I want to show you a short video that summarizes extensive uh, paleontological studies of the fossil record of pelvic reduction that have been uh, carried out by Mike Bell. These are all based on studies of a fossil uh, lake site in Nevada. At this site, diatoms, diachir, float uh, to the bottom of the lake and establish these thin rocky layers that are like growth rings uh, in, in a tree. You can actually walk through time by walking your way uh, up and down the slopes of uh, this quarry. What we're going to show you is uh, detailed studies of the forms of sticklebacks that are present in one section of this quarry that represents about uh, 25,000 years of evolution that Mike's looked at in detail. At each stage, you can pull out rocks, split them uh, from the quarry at lots of different areas to calculate which fish were present at a given time. They come in different forms, including the complete stickleback with a pelvis and a spine, reduced stickleback with a tiny rudiment like you would find in a manatee or whale, or an intermediate form where there's two bones left uh, instead of just one. At each stage in the fossil record, you can count the fish that are seen at a similar layer across rocks in the quarry and calculate what's the percentage of the fish that are reduced or intermediate or complete. And you can do that for successive stages as you walk through time. So this is a summary of actual data from uh, Mike's lab calculating and counting lots of different fish and rocks. They all start out reduced. And then in this series, at about 10,000 years, a new stickleback uh, invades the environment, replaces the, the previous form. This stickleback has a complete pelvis. And a very interesting thing happens over the next 10 or 15,000 years. That complete form re-evolves pelvic reduction with intermediate fossils seen along the way. Okay, we'll show you that time series again. Starts out with a population that's 100% pelvic reduced. Rapid replacement around 10,000 years, new form all with a complete pelvis, and then the re-evolution of a pelvic reduced phenotype, intermediate forms uh, seen along the way. You can also see that in line graph form a blue line for the reduced form that predominates in the early stage, a red line for the complete form that rapidly replaces at 10,000 years, and then the re-evolution of pelvic reduction with an intermediate form summarized by the green line uh, shown during the time series. Okay, so it's remarkable to be able to watch evolutionary change uh, with this level of detail. 
you can actually watch the morphological changes happen as centuries roll by and catch the intermediate forms as a complete stickleback evolves uh, to a pelvic reduced state. Okay, so lots of people ask all the time, where are the fossils uh, that are predicted by evolution? Darwin asked that question himself in 1859. Maybe because Darwin was so honest about pointing out the problems with his theory, there is still a strange urban legend or myth that transitional fossils have never been found and that this is somehow a, a major problem with evolutionary theory. So after 150 years of discoveries in paleontology, that simply isn't true. Where are the key fossils? Well, for early forms of unicellular and multicellular life, the fossils are in ancient Precambrian rocks of Australia. For feathers, they're in Germany. For manatees, they're in Jamaica. For whales, they're in Pakistan and Egypt. For sticklebacks, they're in Nevada. They're actually now in many of your own backpacks for those of the students who uh, participated in the fossil activity yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so the fossil record actually provides incredibly strong support for Darwin's key idea of descent with modification. And I hope anyone who's seriously interested in this issue will look at the data as it exists in 2005, not as it existed in 1859, including all kinds of beautiful fossils, just a small segment of which we've been able to describe uh, in the holiday lectures. So I'll stop there. Well, it's a good time for a break, and we can take a few questions. Yeah? Um, what was the cause of the rapid um, development of the stickleback? So at the point where the complete form, complete form arises. Well, sticklebacks uh, can migrate. Um, there could have been an environmental change. It's not really clear uh, where that stickleback uh, came from. But it's very clear that the complete form arrives in the lake, and all at once, uh, the, the, the structures now have the form of a new stickleback without intermediates along the way. So that does look like a migration or a replacement event instead of a, an evolutionary event. In contrast, when pelvic uh, reduction re-evolves at the site, uh, you clearly see the intermediates along the way. You keep speaking of common ancestors to support evolution, and like, how many common ancestors do you think there are, or like, what types were they? Like, what were kind of the first ancestors of all the different types of organisms we see today? The final paragraph of uh, Darwin's book says, um, life originally breathed by the creator into a few simple forms or one. Okay, so he thought that things uh, must have gotten much simpler he was, um, he allowed the possibility not just of one, of maybe possible, a few simple forms. What the fossil record actually shows is very simple forms at the beginning of the fossil record of life on Earth, uh, bacteria, unicellular animals, unicellular organisms. And then the single-celled, simple prokaryotic organisms uh, begin to be found also with eukaryotic organisms, then multicellular organisms, then more complex forms. Again. I think the key idea of a tree of life is that things are related by descent with modification. It's not clear if the tree has to be very broad or very narrow. It should be simpler at the beginning and more complex uh, later. And that's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what the fossil record shows. You say you found fossils of single-celled microorganisms, and I was wondering if those helped you figure out how the origin of the Earth began, how Earth was created, if it helps explain it. So I think it's also important to remember that uh, Darwin's theory is a theory of how life changes. Right? So there aren't whole chapters of uh, Darwin's book that explain the creation, the, where, where did the universe come from? That's not what Darwin's book is about. Darwin's book is about how life is changed and how organisms are related by descent uh, with modification. I think that's a frequent confusion that you see a lot in debates about religion and evolution, that somehow uh, evolution uh, proves that um, the universe was created uh, by some random process. Evolution describes how life changes once life is here it's not a theory about how life originally arose or why the whole universe, uh, why the whole universe exists. 
Um, I was wondering, uh, does, does the entire process move at one steady rate, or can it sometimes accelerate and be set with different environments in different, uh, during evolutionary time? You know, we're going to come back to that point uh, during, during uh, the second part here because uh, we actually can see jitters in, uh, jitters in the fossil record of evolutionary change. It does happen with uh, different rates at different times, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. Uh, again, there's nothing in the, um, the theory of evolution that says it has to be particularly fast or particularly slow. In fact, we know genetic mechanisms where major genes can have big effects or other genes can have small effects. That could create rapid evolution or slower evolution. Uh, there, there's, no, um, there's no particular rate that evolution requires, and in fact, a range of rates are seen in the fossil record and in an experimental system. Okay, we better come back um, to, the, to the second section. Happy to take uh, more questions uh, here in a minute. Okay, so let's come back to some of these uh, scientific debates about the way um, selection could or couldn't work. One of the um, major debates was uh, whether natural selection would be able to let an interesting new variant affect uh, traits within a population. So as I said, people believed in blending inheritance at the time the origin uh, was first published. The uh, problem that was pointed out was, well, suppose you know, a, a little tiny drop of black ink appeared and was uh, dropped into a giant vat of uh, white liquid like milk. Okay, a tiny drop of black ink in a giant uh, vat of white milk has no effect uh, on the overall color of the vat. It's still just blended out and the population would stay uh, predominantly uh, uh, milky white. Okay, that, sorry, that's even confusing to try to explain because we now know so much more about the genetic mechanisms that actually exist that uh, blending inheritance clearly uh, doesn't happen. The origin was written before any detailed knowledge of genetics, so those kinds of ideas were out there. But when Mendel's laws were rediscovered in 1900, it was clear that variants aren't just lost by blending. In fact, uh, uh, variants exist as stable, uh, stable genetic changes that uh, exist on chromosomes. Those stable variants uh, are sometimes hard to see in populations. Variants can be recessive. But once a mutation arises, it can increase in frequency simply by being transmitted uh, to more and more offspring. We made extensive use of uh, Mendel's laws uh, yesterday in talking about the genetic architecture of corn and uh, Tiacente evolution stickleback evolution uh, and the uh, evolution of color forms in rock pocket mice. Sean actually showed you a simulation based on Mendel's laws and population genetics of how a rare variant, when it appears, doesn't just get blended in. In fact, a small selective advantage, even a 5% uh, increase in the number of offspring that uh, survive and reproduce from a black variant, will lead to a rapid increase in the frequency of that variant over time. So at the population level, the variant doesn't blend. It appears, and if it uh, generates more offspring, it will actually increase in frequency as uh, the, the white form decreases. Now, this data was based on a simulation, but I'd like to compare the results of that simulation with the results of the actual frequency of pelvic forms that are seen in the fossil record that we just described for pelvic reduction in sticklebacks. So here, the line graphs represent uh, the reduced form of pelvis, originally as a rare variant, that sweeps uh, to fixation in uh, the, uh, the successive layers that can be dug up out of this uh, Miocene lake bed. I hope you can see that although this is simulated data, and this is actual data, that the form of the curves are strikingly similar. So variants don't blend when they appear. In fact, uh, they can spread through populations using uh, laws of both uh, Mendel and population genetics that are, that are now well understood and that are also confirmed by observations uh, in real systems. OK, finally, how about this last problem? Uh, do animals simply look too different uh, to come from common ancestors? This is, again, an area that Darwin tried to address uh, in The Origin. Uh, he's got this passage. All living things have much in common, similar germinal vesicles. Uh, we see this also in that the same poison can similarly affect uh, both plants and animals, or that the poison secreted uh, by the gallfly 
uh, will produce growths both on wild roses uh, or on oak trees. Darwin was trying here, uh, but you can tell that at this stage, the knowledge of biochemistry and molecular genetics uh, was so rudimentary that the arguments for the interrelationship of all living forms was still uh, very circumstantial. Since the origin of species, pathways for the synthesis of DNA and RNA and proteins and lipids and carbohydrates have now been worked out in detail. Turns out most bacteria, plants, and animals share fundamental metabolic pathways. They all use ATP for energy. They have lots of other uh, biological characteristics in common. You can actually take enzymes out of one organism like a mammal, mix them together uh, with bacterial extracts, and the enzymes and bits and pieces uh, from different organisms are compatible and can catalyze uh, these reactions. Most importantly, and one of the triumphs of uh, 20th century biology, the molecular basis of heredity has been worked out in detail. So the structure of DNA was discovered in 1953. That led to the identification of a universal code for converting DNA sequence into amino acid sequence in most animals. Same sorts of DNA, same sorts of genetic code, whether you're a virus or a bacteria or a plant or an insect uh, or a mouse or a human. Genes from one organism can actually replicate and function in another, a striking confirmation of the common biochemical and genetic heritage of all living things. Finally, very different looking animals are actually built uh, using similar genes and pathways. One of the most striking examples of this uh, was originally found uh, in research in Drosophila, the fruit fly. Drosophila has a whole set of key developmental control genes called Hox genes. These genes occur in clusters along the chromosome, and the expression pattern of the genes in the embryos is related to their position along the cluster. So the blue genes here at the one end of the cluster are expressed at the head end of the embryo that's shown there in the bottom right. The colored genes in the middle are expressed in the middle of the embryo. And the green genes at the end of the cluster are expressed in the tail region of the embryo. So those genes aren't just expressed at different anterior, posterior, head to tail uh, positions. They're also required for the formation of the particular tissues that you find from the head to the tail of the adult Drosophila. So if you make mutations in those genes, you change the development of the characteristic tissues that should form along the anterior posterior body axis. Well, surprisingly, although animals look very different, mice look very different from fruit flies, their anterior posterior body axis is built from the very same uh, sets of genes. So mice and humans, other vertebrates, have uh, sequences that are closely related to these Hox genes of flies. The Hox genes in mammals also occur in clusters. The clusters are also expressed in patterns that are related to anterior posterior development. Blue genes at one end of the cluster, they've actually duplicated, so there's more copies in, in mammals. But blue genes at the end of the clusters are expressed in the head regions of the embryo, shown at the lower left. The middle genes are expressed in the middle part of the embryo. The green genes at the end of the cluster are expressed in the tail region of the embryo. And just as in fruit flies, if you make mutations in these uh, key Hox genes, those mutations alter the formation of the characteristic tissues that would normally form at each position along the anterior posterior body axis of the mouse. So it looks like the head to tail axis of animals, even that look completely different, are in fact built by an ancient toolkit of these key developmental regulators called Hox genes. Similar uh, toolkit genes have been discovered that control a range of other structures uh, in diverse organisms. So the Hox genes for the anterior posterior axis, other sets of genes for the dorsal ventral axis, other toolkit genes for the left right axis, and other toolkit genes uh, for the formation of particular body tissues. To give an example of one particular tissue, uh, eye development. So eyes, very interesting structures found in lots of different animals. They look quite different uh, in different animals. That's a human eye and a Drosophila eye. Human eyes uh, has single light-gathering uh, organ and lens. In contrast, insects have these compound eyes, thousands of little uh, light-gathering organs all in a, a little crystalline array. The histology of the eyes uh, is quite different, single light-gathering lens for the mammalian eye and this array of uh, independent little light-gathering units in the compound eye of insects. Although those eyes look very different, it turns out that the same toolkit gene 
is required for eye development in many different organisms. So this gene is called PAX6. If you make a mutation in one chromosome, the one of the two copies of PAX6 uh, during human development, you begin to lose uh, particular parts of the eye, in particular the colored uh, iris muscle that normally surrounds the pupil. So you can see there the eye of a, a patient with a uh, defect in one copy of his PAX6 gene, and that produces uh, the absence of an iris, a, a disease called aniridia, so the pupil now nearly fills the eye. Similarly, in the mouse, mutation in one of the two copies of the PAX6 gene partially reduces uh, the size of the eye. Mutations in both copies completely eliminate the eye, the uh, mouse uh, embryo head shown at the upper right. Although Drosophila eyes look very different than mammalian eyes, there's a similar PAX6 gene in fruit flies, and if you make a mutation in that gene, you eliminate the compound eye of the, the fruit fly. Even more remarkably, if you overexpress this key uh, developmental regulator of eye formation, you can generate new eye tissue in completely different body parts. So this is an experiment that was done uh, by uh, Walter Gehring's lab, taking this PAX6 gene and engineering it to be expressed uh, during leg development in a uh, developing fruit fly. You can see when you overexpress uh, the eye regulator gene, you induce on the leg of the fruit fly a tiny little patch of red compound eye tissue. If you do a scanning electron micrograph, that structure has exactly the kind of independent repeated uh, eye unit that you would find in the normal fly eye. And remarkably, you can get that result whether you do the experiment with the fly pack 6 gene or with a pack 6 gene from mice. So we think that genes like PAX6 are part of an ancient toolkit that's been inherited from a common ancestor and can be put to work to build related structures, even uh, in very different looking animals. So how do these sorts of uh, master regulators work? Well, many of the ancient uh, toolkit genes that control the development of the AP body axis or the formation of a particular tissue turn out to encode gene products that act by switching other genes on and off. Okay, so for example, to build an eye, you have to express uh, lens proteins and photoreceptors. What the PAX6 gene does is it acts as a regulatory molecule that flips switches on target genes and causes things like lens proteins and photoreceptors uh, to be expressed at the site where the PAX6 gene is expressed. So we have a short video uh, to show that kind of uh, regulatory structure. So this is a gene with the yellow part uh, of the DNA, uh, the coding part colored yellow. That might encode something like a lens protein. It would normally only be expressed if an RNA polymerase lands on the gene's promoter and makes a messenger RNA from the gene. The coding region of the gene is surrounded by a series of regulatory switches. So these are parts of DNA that don't code for any protein. Instead, they act as switches that determine where and when the gene turns on. Those switches are the landing sites for regulatory molecules that bind to the switches, recruit DNA polymerase to the gene's promoter, and cause an increase in the total number of messenger RNA transcripts that's coming from the gene. So typically, a gene will be surrounded by multiple uh, switches. That allows the gene to be turned on at different times and places uh, under the control of different signals and regulatory molecules. A lens protein in the mouse is also expressed in the liver, for example. It might have a switch where a regulatory molecule turns it on in the eye lens. The PAX6 gene is an example of a regulatory molecule that would bind to one of those switches. There'd be a different switch uh, for turning the gene on uh, in the liver. Okay, with that background on master regulators, uh, let's come back uh, to the problem of forelimb and hindlimb uh, development in different animals. Forelimbs or hindlimbs are good examples of structures that vary in different uh, ways along the anterior-posterior body axis. So forelimbs and hindlimbs can become wings or legs, short legs or in the hopping legs, uh, spines and fins uh, in fish. All vertebrates share Another set of toolkit uh, master regulatory genes that are involved in controlling the formation of hind limbs or forelimbs. So these uh, slides show a series of chick embryos that have been stained uh, with a blue dye. This is a method that allows you to look at where an individual gene is being expressed. So you see sites of blue at the sites where the gene is normally turning on. There's a gene called TBX5 that's expressed 
in the wing bud of a chick, but not the leg. There's another gene called TBX4 that's expressed in the hind uh, leg, but not the wing. There's another gene called PIDX1 that turns on in the leg, but not the wing. So all vertebrates uh, have these master regulatory genes that are expressed in one limb or the other and help determine uh, how the limbs normally form. Doesn't matter whether you're a fish or a frog or a chick uh, or a mouse, uh, these genes are turning on in uh, one limb structure or the other. So what's happened in organisms where the development of one limb has been drastically altered? So we went through yesterday the example of completely losing the hind limb uh, in natural populations of sticklebacks. And I summarized a series of uh, genetic experiments that showed that a major gene located at the distal end of linkage group 7 controls the presence or the absence of the pelvis uh, in these natural populations. So it's possible to actually uh, also determine the location of these toolkit master regulators that are known to be involved in hind limb or forelimb development. When you do that, it turns out that one of the hind limb master regulatory layers maps exactly to the locus that controls the presence or absence of the hind fin uh, in the sticklebacks. That gene is called the PIDX1 gene, the one uh, I showed you on the earlier expression slides as well. This gene actually plays several different roles uh, during normal development. You may wonder why it's called PIDX1. Well, in addition uh, to normally turning on in hind limbs but not forelimbs, it also turns on in some other body tissues. It turns on in the pituitary and plays an important role in controlling pituitary gene expression. It also turns on in uh, jaws and mouth parts. If you completely eliminate the PIDX1 gene in a mouse, you shrink the hind limbs, but the mouse dies at birth with pituitary abnormalities and, uh, and jaw abnormalities, craniofacial defects. In some ways, that doesn't look very promising for trying to use this gene to evolve a new structure in uh, populations that are subject to a full range of fitness constraints in the wild. On the other hand, if you look at what's happened to the PIDX1 gene uh, in sticklebacks, the protein coding region of the gene has not changed at all in marine and pelvic reduced sticklebacks. In contrast, if you look at where this toolkit gene is normally expressed in embryos, there is an obvious difference in PIDX1 expression. So now we're seeing blue at those sites where the PIDX1 gene is expressed in either a marine or a pelvic reduced population. You can see in the marine population expression in the blue mouth and jaw regions. It also turns on in a spot uh, at the side of the body where the hind fin would normally grow out. You can also see that from the belly of the fish uh, here in the lower left uh, with two spots where the hind limbs would normally form. In the pelvic reduced population, you still have normal expression in the developing head region, the mouth and the jaw parts, but at the site in the body where the hind limb would normally form, the PIDX1 gene uh, normally no longer turns on uh, in that location. So what do we think is happening? Uh, that's summarized uh, in the final brief animation. Both the marine and the pelvic reduced population have a PIDX1 locus. The coding region of the gene is still intact in both populations. This gene, we think, is surrounded by a series of these regulatory switches that cause it to turn on in specific body parts, like the jaw or the pituitary or the hind limb. In both populations, some of those switches are still present and function normally. So the genes expressed normally in the mouth parts. You still build normal mouths and jaws in both populations. Still expressed in the pituitary, you still form a normal pituitary uh, in both organisms. In the marine population, it turns on in the hind limb and you build the pelvis. In the reduced population, the hind limb control switch has been inactivated. You no longer express the PIDX1 gene at that location, and as a result, the hind limb fails to form uh, in the fish. Okay, you'll hear from Sean that similar tweaking with these switches that surround genes provides a very flexible method for evolution to use to create major changes, morphological changes in particular body regions, but still preserve uh, the overall viability, the coding region, and the expression of the genes uh, in other tissues. Okay, I've gone through uh, limb reduction uh, in some detail. I think it's a great sort of trait. It's evolved uh, repeatedly in lots of different animals. It's an example of a uh, sort of macroevolutionary change that's seen uh, in whales and manatees. And it's a kind of trait now where evolutionary studies have made it possible to document major morphological change that occurs in naturally occurring species, to trace those changes uh, through the fossil record, 
to track down the number and the location of the chromosome regions that control the morphological differences, to identify specific genes that normally build the corresponding morphological structure, and to study how those genes have changed uh, in natural populations. So we now know a lot more about the detailed molecular mechanisms that control these sorts of traits than we did at the time that Darwin wrote, but the details and the additional data that come from many fields all support the key original idea of descent with modification. That's exactly uh, what's supposed to happen with a good scientific theory. Science should fundamentally both explain existing data and make predictions. As we've seen, Darwin predicted that the Earth must be old, that transitional fossils must have existed in the past, that variants must be able to arise and spread through populations, and that very different organisms uh, must be related to one another. Every one of those predictions has been resoundingly confirmed by all kinds of independent data from physics, from geology, from paleontology, from genetics, from biochemistry, from molecular biology, and from embryology. That's why evolution is regarded as a well-established fact by scientists, and that's why uh, we consider it a key organizing principle for understanding all of biology and the interrelationships uh, between living forms. So I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah? Uh, how do um, <coughs> major changes in the gene structure, like the addition of new chromosomes or reduction of chromosomes that you can see in different animals that have different uh, number of chromosomes, how do those take place? There's Lots of different mechanisms that can alter DNA sequence. Sean mentioned single base pair changes that can occur uh, by errors of replication during uh, cell, cell, cell replication. That occurs randomly and will just alter individual base pairs. There's also transposable elements that will hop around. There's also gene duplication events that take place. In fact, we now have genome sequences of lots of different animals, and you can see how whole gene sections uh, have been duplicated, creating uh, new regions. We think that those kinds of mechanisms provide uh, a flexible basis of generating the kinds of genetic variation that underlies uh, the things that evolution can do to produce uh, new alterations in morphology. Shouldn't just go to one side of the room. Yeah. Uh, my name's Andrew. In the example of the Drosophilia with the extra eye on its leg, did yeah. that eye work, and did it affect the working of the two regular eyes on its head? So remarkably, um, that extra eye spot is actually innervated. And if you shine light on the leg of the fly and record from the neurons that project to that ectopic eye patch, they respond to the light. So um, it's a remarkably uh, semi-functional eye uh, that not only has the right lens proteins and photoreceptors, but actually is innervated, will respond to light, and stimulate electrical activity. And down to the last of the t-shirts here. Yeah. I want to go back to Darwin for a second. You said before that in the last paragraph of his book, Darwin mentioned a creator. And I was just wondering why so many religious figures and religious and gr groups of people who are religious even today react so negatively to Darwin's theories, even though he clearly, or at least pretended to clearly, still believe in a creator. So we'll talk more about that this afternoon. I th the point I'd like to make is that in fact, uh, most major religious groups in the world don't see a conflict uh, between uh, evolution and religion, uh, including the Pope himself, uh, who looks at the same data that I summarized here and says this is independent uh, data that overwhelmingly supports uh, the theory of evolution. There's not a conflict between the idea that life has been modified generated uh, by a process of evolution and descent with modification. That's a separate issue from where the universe uh, originally came from and what set everything off at the beginning. The Bible also doesn't say how God created things. You know, it says it all came from dust. That's not so different than uh, you know, an evolutionary model where from very simple beginnings, uh, life forms are generated by descent with modification. How um, the fossil record earlier? You found yeah, earlier in the fossil record that you found the, like the the single cell microorganisms. But how how do you go around looking for single cell microorganisms and fossils when there's so many rocks on Earth and they're, they're so tiny? Yeah. 
That's actually why that gap in the fossil record existed for a long time, because it wasn't clear how to recognize the early forms of, of life on Earth. One of the, the real breakthroughs came from a realization that sometimes these single-celled microorganisms will accumulate in large mats. So you can actually see this today off the western coast of Australia. There's these structures called stromatolite. Uh, stromatolite-like structures, which are these big mat-like forms of cyanobacteria that uh, form, and they're big enough that they actually make uh, a giant kind of mushroom that's just full of, uh, full of bacteria. So those forms can be seen today, and those are the structures that were first recognized uh, in, in the fossil record. Very similar sorts of accumulations, incredibly high density, all laid out in little chains and mats, just like you would see today in, in a modern structure off of uh, Australia. These bacteria still exist in the world today. And they can be recognized in the fossil record originally because of that unusual uh, grouping of them. And then once uh, it was clear that those things existed, you could begin looking for more and more rocks that had the characteristics that they would have been laid down in the kind of nearshore environments where those structures are formed. This is my last t-shirt, but I hope that doesn't mean the end of the question. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if they've been able to trace the evolution of viruses as well, and possibly when viruses first came into existence from specific tissues. So there's lots of work when new uh, diseases break out. There's lots of questions about where the disease organism uh, came from. So that's looked at by sequencing the virus and trying to see how it's related to, to other known viruses. Uh, as patients are treated with drugs, Viral resistant form, drug resistant forms of the virus will emerge within the body. A dramatic example of evolution occurring in medicine. Again, if you sequence the genome of the viruses that have emerged in a patient that's being treated with drugs, you can see individual base pair changes that have occurred within the virus that are part of the evolution of uh, drug resistance. So, in fact, the strategies that doctors use to try to suppress uh, uh, viral infections are heavily based on the idea of trying to minimize the chance that viral resistant forms uh, will pop out and spread. The best way to do that is to treat patients with multiple drugs simultaneously so that even if a single base pair change occurs, there's some other drug that is inhibiting multiple parts of the virus uh, independently and keeps the infection uh, sprossed down. Okay, thanks very much. Those were great questions and I'll turn things back over uh, to Tom. Thank you, David Kingsley, for an outstanding talk. We're going to break now for half an hour. When we return, Sean Carroll will conclude our journey of evolution by talking about human fossils and also human genetics. Mm -hmm.